great to be with everyone in the motor capital of the world, the city that put the world on wheels. I'm very proud and I would say nostalgic about being here in Detroit today because 32 years ago, the first time I entered Michigan was actually in an electric car. I had the opportunity at Virginia Tech to design, build, and race a solar car from Orlando, Florida to Warren Tech Center, Michigan. And that was because General Motors decided in their quest to build an electric car that they needed to do workforce development. It's a topic that's so near and dear to my heart as I think about building my own company, is how are we going to retool and keep up with the technologies that are coming in the future? And part of it is that we need to be inspired, we need to create a program that helps people engage. And as I look at that, and I think about all of us being on a journey that is never ending, it's a journey of learning and trying to figure out where we've been, where are we now, where do we want to go? I'd like to share with you a bit of history. It's your history. It's our shared history. If you look back on electric vehicles and where they began, they actually began really at the birth of the automobile. I tried to figure out, and I like to find the origin of things. Where did something start? Because you can be inspired by those people that could see something that other people at the time could not. And so I went to the Smithsonian Archives and I looked for a journal that would describe the, in the words of that day, not someone writing history about others, but actually looking at the articles in a journal published in the day documenting what was going on. And I found this fascinating journal called, obviously, Automobiles, because I, I was looking for people trying to put themselves on wheels that's a good place to start. And one of the founders of the early society of automotive engineering was a guy named Riker. And he ended up with the first electric vehicle company that then raced in a, a car, an electric car, in a sea of other vehicles, gasoline, steam, and electric. And he was the winner of the first 50-mile race in America. And actually, I found that very inspiring because it wasn't that electric cars were an inferior product to the gasoline vehicle. They were leading. The next person that I came across was a guy named Baker. And he decided that he was going to push the speed limits. And he built a race car and did, made the first automobile that ever traveled 100 miles per hour. That was also very fascinating. At the time, gasoline vehicles were running 20 to 25 miles per hour this was a very remarkable achievement for the day. In fact, the President of the United States, when he visited Connecticut, was given a ride in an electric car, and not only was his ride in an electric car, but his Secret Service were on electric bikes. And so that entire procession was demonstrating that electric vehicles were not just a part of mobility, they could very well be the, the mobility that everyone sought. As we look to the 1910s and 10 years of invention and development, the first home charging stations were being developed by General Electric. The first demonstrations of an electric car that could do 200 miles on a single charge were being uh, put out there, and, and Thomas Edison was part of that story with his new batteries. The first time a car went on a journey of 1,000 miles, showing that it could charge along the way was also in the 1910s. And I think it's really fascinating, the bottom right picture, where American Express, as a company, decided to go electric with their commercial trucks. And all of their delivery vehicles with their heavy payloads were electric. And in that time, they even talked about, one of the buyers was quoted as saying, I'm not sure about the explosion engine and really gasoline. I'm not, I'm not really sure about the safety of gasoline. So really, in the early days, electric vehicles had more than an advantage. In fact, more than 50% of the world on wheels at that time in 1900 was electric. Now, this factory is just was, was standing just three miles up the road called the Anderson Electric Car Company. And the Anderson Electric Car Company made the most successful, largest, and longest standing factory for electric vehicles. And they named the vehicle the Detroit Electric. 
They produced vehicles from 1907 to 1939, and in that quest of making these electric cars, they were in the center of mobility growing and also job creation and also factories that could mass produce products. Henry Ford, Thomas Edison were amongst the customers of this type of product, and they also invested heavily, both Ford Motor Company as well as Thomas Edison on batteries, in trying to bring about lower cost and better solutions for electric vehicles. Thomas Edison's battery went from lead acid batteries at 50 miles up to around 80 miles with a nickel iron battery. And as this company was taking off, you would expect that really electric cars were certain to be successful. However, there was a problem. The problem was that electric cars did not meet the fundamental requirements of the market speaking to two of the most important attributes, cost and range. And I read a book by Geoffrey Moore that talks about crossing the chasm. It's when you do an early innovator product, some people will buy it because they're just fascinated. You'll get an early adoption market when the product technologies start to look like they're real products, but the mass markets will not come until you overcome all of the obstacles where people just don't have to worry about the product being a compromise. The best products will always win the mass market. And so as I think about that, that's where I want to now draw from the lessons learned of crossing the chasm. In fact, it's so interesting to me that 100 years ago was the birth center of electric vehicle, and we're right now at the second birth center of electric vehicle. In 2020, I think we're standing at that chasm and it's not a foregone conclusion that we will be successful unless we pay attention to what happened in the past, which is really around the topic of range. So what we decided to do to really analyze this problem is we plotted all of the vehicles that are in present day, and the colors of the dots relate to chemistry. Nickel and cobalt chemistries are in gray, and those are the successful chemistries of electric vehicles today. Those are the chemistries to get electric cars to about 300 miles of range. But the problem with that range number that everyone's being promised is they don't realize when you drive on the highway or at, you're at cold temperature or both, you're gonna lose range. And it's not just a small amount, it's not a few percent, it can be up to 50% of the range of an electric vehicle being lost at 80 miles per hour and say on a zero degree C day. That's a problem. Customers are not going to accept that problem, and as I looked at that and I analyzed where electric cars are today, I think there's this advent and this promising future where we want to see a transition, but we don't necessarily have that secured until we make products that fundamentally address three topics. We need to address range. We need to make sure the chemistries that we pick for batteries are safe. They don't threaten the vehicle with fires and, and subsequently even personal property and homes being threatened with fires. That's an absolutely unacceptable situation. And then finally, our supply chain has to be robust. And I, I would say it's just simple economics that if a material is abundant, it'll be low cost. So we decided to go after making battery chemistries viable that could double the range of EVs, do it without nickel cobalt, and develop the strategies for low cost by getting to abundant materials and local supply chains. As we set the target of doubling this range of electric vehicles, we're really learning from our shared past. We're developing a thesis that in order to be successful, it's not a 300 mile electric car, it's gonna to need to be 600 because we have to account for the real world being an unkind place in order to deliver the functions that people are looking for we really need a lot more energy on board for electric vehicles. And this picture of my team is the founding of our company. We're standing with a 1922 Detroit Electric, built 100 years ago to this year, exactly in that factory that was three miles up the road. We're really fascinated with that history. And as we look to that past and we share it, we're also now working together here in Michigan to build a technology and then a factory that can double the range of electric vehicles. And our first proof point that it's possible, and remember, back to Baker and Riker and the people that were setting range records and 
uh, going after top speed is they were pushing the technology to its limits, exploring how that boundary would be enhanced by dreaming further forward than anyone else had previously dared to dream. And we demonstrated this vehicle last year going to the Upper Peninsula and back at 752 miles on a single charge, which makes me very hopeful that this quest to cross the chasm this time, do it successfully, is possible if we put our minds together, we learn from our past. But most importantly, we're not here alone. Let's work with our entire ecosystem of partners to work together to bring this future forward. Thank you for your time. It's great to be here. Thank you.